to him. He says in Revelation 19, verse 16, or it says of him in Revelation 19, verse 16, On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. It is that Lord Jesus whom we gather together in his presence this morning. Hopefully there will be a slide come up of Psalm 116. I will say the first section, and then if you could come in, everyone, together, at the bold sections where it says, oh, just to remind us of the God in whom we worship this morning. So you come in at all. The Lord is gracious and righteous. The Lord protects the unwary. Excellent. Uh, Our first song speaks of that salvation, of that great rescue. Children, as you listen to this song, I want you to listen out and count how many times you hear the word holy. Okay? Are you ready? Got your ears ready? How many times, if you're listening at home, children, can you hear the word holy in this song? Then we'll talk a little bit about what that word means. Let's uh, listen in the building but you can sing at home.
children, how many times do you think you saw the word holy? Uh, I can see a hand over there. Can you say it out loud? 24. 24 times. <laughs> Did anyone else count and have a different? 26. I'll let you two work it out afterwards. <laughs> The word holy means to be set apart, to be different, to be special. Some of our Bible study groups during the week have been considering God's holiness as they've been looking at Exodus and God's amazing rescue of his people out of Egypt. The whole Bible story is a story about rescue. And so we're going to encourage one another this morning by saying the words again from Psalm 116 that appear on the screen. I'll say the first section. If everyone could come in on the bold section that says all. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? Return to your rest, my soul. For you, Lord, have delivered me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Thank you. When we turn to the Lord God, to our holy God, we find rest for our souls. Let's then turn to him this morning and confess our sins before him and find that promised rest. In a moment, some words will come up that we can say together. Children, why don't you have a look at these words as well, as this is one of the ways that we can say sorry to God for the, for the way we've not treated him as a holy God this week. All together we say... Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who were once dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, we find rest. We find the forgiveness of sins. Let's respond then with these great words of assurance. I'll say verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? Next slide. Blank. Uh, The death of one of his servants is indeed precious to the Lord. And in Mark's Gospel this morning, short videos uh, that you can watch with a friend or a family member or even flick on the link to someone to watch. Uh, There are three questions at the end of each video uh, to help really begin a conversation about the Lord Jesus and and what his claims are. So if you're online or if you're here in the building, keep an eye out for Knowing Life, episode two, uh, airing uh, Monday on YouTube. Uh, The next bit of news is regarding our very first Send Sunday. That'll be next Sunday, so can I encourage you not to miss it? 
Uh, our vision here at St. Nicholas is to know Jesus and to make him known locally and globally. We do that a few different ways, but one of the ways we do that is by equipping Christians for acts of service, for acts of gospel service. But we don't hog them and hold them to ourselves because the Lord Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we'll be celebrating as we send off our beloved Keiko to Japan next Sunday and Sophie Matthews to Tunbridge Wells. So please don't miss our very first Send Sunday. It'll be very exciting. And lastly today, um, normally around this time of year, we would bring in shoe boxes for Samaritan's Purse for Operation Christmas Child. Obviously with COVID, there are restrictions about physical gifts. So you can actually make a donation. You can, you can secure a box online through their website. Uh, the Samaritan's Purse have sent us a video to us here at St. Nicholas in Seven Oaks. Uh, hopefully they'll come up now. So please do watch and listen. Hello, St. Nicholas Seven Oaks Church. I'm really sorry I can be with you today, but thank you very much. And uh, it's my privilege, privilege uh, to share my story. I'm Angel and I'm 37 years old. I'm from Bulgaria, the last five years I live in Ningo. And I have two children, Aya and Gogo. I work in, in the small bar house, um, it's like quality control. Uh, when, I, when I was uh, 13 years, I lived in, I lived in the, a small village in Bulgaria, in the orphanage with 70 another children is different age. Uh, every Christmas uh, you, uh, time you like it, uh, Christmas, uh, because you receive the different stuff, different things, food, clothes, the different toys. But one uh, Christmas is was different for me because um, the, this Christmas you receive uh, one box. When I was 13 years old, I received the uh, the personal present. Uh, that is, was a very precious for me, a moment for me because I uh, never receive uh, during Christmas time the Christmas present. So I remember the people who is uh, give us this uh, this box. So that was the family who is uh, serving to young people. And uh, the next year, they invite some of us uh, for uh, for holiday in the sum, summer camp. And the, this and the, this summer camp uh, is what changed my life because and one evening they invite uh, for e evening pre evening. And this evening I took decision to. Uh, God to be my savior. To they share more about Jesus, about uh, Jesus' love. It's it's why it's important to believe and trust the God. So that's it's not just boxes. When I receive this Christmas, I receive more things. I receive more love, more hope. That's why I share uh, my story with you today. I want to just thank you for everyone who is support us, who is packed bo uh, boxes every year for children around the world. I want to invite this year as well to do that because I, tr I believe uh, every children around the world need to receive the hope, love, they need to know they need to receive the good news and joy and i want to say again big thank you very much and i trust god you know that thank you and happy christmas
My name is Hannah and uh, we're going to do something together as a church family. So if you do have things in your hands, if you've been busy doing your word search boys and girls or eating something or something, why don't you put them out of your hands? You'll need them in a minute and show me that you've got hands ready for our activity. Fantastic. Thank you. I see lots of grown-ups hands, which is very encouraging. Um, in your pods, you have uh, a few pieces of cardboard and you have a thick, um, I'm going to say a thick texture, that is as an, an Australian word. You have a thick pen uh, for drawing or writing. You, in your pods, so your four or five or six people who are in a pod together, have about 30 seconds to choose and draw something that has happened so far in our Mark series. If you can't quite remember, you might have a Bible in your pods, grab it and open it up to Mark chapter 4 or 5 or 6, and you might, that might jog your memory a bit. And you've got 30 seconds starting now. Alright, just a few seconds left, so finishing touches to your words or your pictures. And why not do a countdown? Five, four, three, two, one. Alright, I am going to need you to tell me by holding up your picture if you are a pod who decided to draw a picture of Jesus when he calms the storm, did we have anyone? We have the Griffith. There are people who are just a really long way away at the moment, but it's okay. I brought my National Trust binoculars, so uh, I'm going to be able to uh, see. It will be all right. And I think, I think I can see Charlie. Is that you with a picture of the storm being calmed? Fantastic. Did anybody hold up your pictures? Did anybody draw a picture of Jesus when he sent the demons out of the man and into the pigs? The Begbies have one, I can see that. Oh, lovely pig there, Scott. Well done. Tilly, I'm going to need to... Oh, yes, very nice. Well done, Caninas. Uh, hold up your picture if you drew a, a picture of the girl, the little girl who was dead, who Jesus brought back to life. I can see two pictures there, a before and an after, am I right? Fantastic. All the way at the back, Martha. Fantastic. Well done. And you might have drawn two pictures, one similar. Did anybody get the woman who was sick, the woman who had a bad illness and Jesus healed her? Do we have anyone? Oh, we may have missed out on the woman. No worries, we'll remember that that happened. And do we have anyone who drew something from last week when Jesus was not accepted, when he came back to his hometown and when he couldn't do any miracles? I'm not surprised about that one. It's not a very exciting one to draw, but well done, everyone. Um, do keep listening. Hold on to your picture because today our Bible story from Mark includes the ruler, Herod. We've been learning about lots of people who are perishing, people who are dying, and you held up pictures that showed those things. Today, this Bible story is a flashback to something that happened in the past. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we've got the Bible reading and we've got the sermon to do that. But you might remember a man called John the Baptist. And John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord. He prepared the way for Jesus. John the Baptist preached about the kingdom of God. And Herod quite liked he listening to John. But John often said to Herod that he needed to repent, that he needed to stop living his own way, that he needed to turn around and that he needed to start living God's way. And so we're going to hear from the Bible about Herod's birthday party. Put up your hand if you like having birthday parties. Put up your hand if you like going to birthday parties. 
Put up your hand if you feel like you've had too many birthday parties and they just come around too soon. Fantastic. We're going to hear about a choice that Herod had to make at his birthday party. We're going to hear about a choice about who he would listen to and a choice about who he would obey. Would it be John who spoke God's words or would it be his friends who did not speak God's words? So boys and girls and everyone else, of course, make sure that you listen as the Bible is read today. We're going to have that in just a minute. Make sure you listen as Angus preaches and make sure that you're using your ears. You've got activity sheets that will help you to be able to join in with what we're doing and what we're hearing and to remember. And afterwards, you can talk to your family or the people who are in your pods about the things that you have heard. So make sure that you listen up. But I'm for the moment going to hand over to Emily, who's going to come and help us to talk to God. Um, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love towards us in pouring out the Spirit of Christ. Please equip us with all that we need by your Spirit so that we might serve Christ and the Gospel more faithfully. Grant that we would increasingly seek to serve others with generous hearts which reflect the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things through his precious name. Amen. Lord God, as we look around us, we can't help but see the effects that the outbreak of coronavirus is having, both in our country and worldwide. We know you are a sovereign Lord who holds all things in your hands. Please help us to trust you even more so at this time. When we're tempted to worry or to doubt your goodness to us, please bring us back to your word and ultimately the cross, where we see your great love for us shown by Jesus' death. Would we be quick to speak of your gospel hope to those who don't yet know you and those who are struggling in any way, be it spiritually, physically, emotionally or financially? We also pray that we would be aware of those in our congregation who are particularly in particular support and prayer at this time. Amen. Father God, as we know the importance of washing our hands with soap and water, we pray for those people who live in places where they don't have water available in their homes or nearby, and where soap is a luxury item they can't afford. We pray for Tear Fund and its church partners around the world who are working hard to enable families to have these items. We pray for our mission partner, Rachel Stevens, as she works alongside staff based overseas to help develop plans to enable this work to happen. We pray for wisdom, good communication across different cultures, and for favour as they submit plans to different potential funders. Amen. And finally, Father, we want to pray for the Samaritan's Purse Christmas Shoebox Appeal. With the changes made this year, given the different circumstances, we ask that you would bless their work. As they move to online packing, would we respond with generosity and compassion? Would these shoeboxes be a way of showing the love of Christ and be used to make links with local churches and Christian organisations in the countries where they are distributed. Amen. Our reading this week is from Mark chapter 6, um, reading from the International Children's Bible. So that's um, Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 14. King Herod heard about Jesus because Jesus was now well known. Some people said, he is John the Baptist. He is risen from death. That is the reason he can work these miracles. Others said, he is Elijah. Other people said, Jesus is a prophet. He is like the prophets who lived long ago. Herod heard all these things about Jesus. He said, I killed John by cutting off his head. Now he has been raised from death. Herod himself had ordered his soldiers to arrest John, and John was put in prison. Herod did this to please his wife Herodias. Herodias was the wife of Philip, Herod's brother, but then Herod married her. John told Herod it, that it was not lawful for him to be married to his brother's wife. So Herodias hated John and wanted to kill him. 
but she could not because of Herod. Herod was afraid to kill John because he knew John was a good and holy man, so Herod protected John. Also, Herod enjoyed listening to John preach, but John's preaching always bothered him. Then the perfect time came for Herodias to cause John's death. It happened on Herod's birthday. Herod gave a dinner party for the most important government leaders, the commanders of his army, and the most important people in Galilee. The daughter of Herodias came to the party and danced. When she danced, Herod and the people eating with him were very pleased. So King Herod said to the girl, I will give you anything you want. He promised her, anything you ask for, I will give to you. I will even give you half of my kingdom. The girl went to her mother and asked, What should I ask the king to give me? Her mother answered, Ask for the head of John the Baptist. Quickly the girl went back to the king. She said to him, Please give me the head of John the Baptist. Bring it to me now on a platter. The king was very sad but he had promised to give the girl anything she wanted. And the people eating there with him had heard his promise. So Herod could not refuse what, he, what she asked. Immediately the king sent a soldier to bring John's head. The soldier went and cut off John's head in the prison and brought it back, back on a platter. He gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. John's followers heard what had happened. So they came and got John's body and put it in a tomb. Good morning. Good morning. Can I lead us out? Heavenly Father, we pray that your word would be our guide. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we pray that your kingdom would be our supreme concern. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, as we perhaps look out on our gardens just now, uh, it's autumn, getting into winter, and there might be various things perhaps that we've planted or perhaps that we've uh, hacked back, and uh, they're looking uh, very, very weak indeed. Uh, not much colour, uh, and yet, and yet, though they currently look very, very weak, uh, perhaps uh, by spring or next summer, they will be blooming once again. There'll be uh, unstoppable growth. Well, what is true physically can also happen spiritually. And uh, th this is uh, a picture uh, taken from Iran. And uh, currently in Iran, well, the church is small, it's weak, it's vulnerable, it's facing all sorts of persecution. Christians are imprisoned, pastors are killed, churches are routinely closed. And yet, and yet, though the church is very weak, currently, both inside and outside Iran, uh, there is exponential growth. And look at all these baptisms happening. It's a, it's a wonderful picture. So God uses our weakness. Now, in our situation, we also may feel very, very weak uh, and vulnerable. A minority uh, on our street um, or in the workplace in terms of being a believer, marginalised within society. But we constantly need to be reminded that God typically works through weakness. Now, as we come to Mark, perhaps Mark uh, even learnt that uh, as he observed Paul. Just a, a tiny detour, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, where Paul, uh, Paul says, Only Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you, because he's helpful to me in my ministry. Uh, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. So Paul, he is weak. He's cold. He's old. He's uh, in prison. He's struggling. He is very, very weak. And yet earlier in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, and perhaps he shared this with Mark, he was saying, uh, 
even though I am suffering uh, to the point of being chained like a criminal, God's word is not changed. God works through weakness. Mark saw that in Paul. And Mark, our gospel writer, as he comes to this section, chapter 6, verses 7 to 30, we have the same truth, that even amidst weakness, God's power is at work, and we need to heed that lesson uh, today. So let's come to our first heading, where we see that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the word is so weak verses 17 to 29. Now, you might think, well, that's the wrong title because God's word is so strong. But bear with me just for a moment. Uh, I know all about that. We'll come to that in a bit. But it certainly looks in verses 17 to 29 that the word is so weak. You'll see that there is a battle going on between the word and the the world. It's a tug of war. Often in a tug of war, the teams can be fairly evenly matched, but sadly not here. And that should be a shock to us. As we look at the passage, it's all set up, uh, set out there uh, on the screen. You can't possibly read that small print, but just uh, look at the section in yellow. That's the bit that we're going to be covering now, 17 to 29. Now, Herod is the ruler uh, in Galilee. Three times he is referred to as the king. And amazingly, in verse 20, we are told when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. So that's an amazing thing that Herod liked to listen to God's word. Perhaps that's not something that we would usually think. So that's great. But two things happen to John within this narrative. The first one we see in verses 17 to 20 is that Herod arrests John. Why does he do that? Well, it's because of his wife Herodias, verse 17. Now, Herod had married Herodias, but Herodias was his divorced brother's wife and who also happened to be Herod's niece. So you can certainly see see that it was complicated. And what had happened is that John the Baptist had very courageously, very faithfully proclaimed God's word to them. Uh, Verse 18, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So he had preached God's word, but the world, the voice of the world, the voice of Herodias was stronger. And as a result of that, Herod was persuaded to arrest John. So she bore this grudge, it says, against uh, uh, John the Baptist, uh, verse 19. So Herod arrests John, the world wins. But then we see that in the next part of the narrative, verses 21 to 29, that Herod executed John. Why? Well, because of peer pressure. Peer pressure was like a a steamroller, a bulldozer uh, that runs over everything else. We know how strong it can be, and it was certainly strong in this instance. You see, what is described, verse 21, Herod had a birthday party. He gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. All the important folk were there, uh, and uh, Herod was there in the middle. His wife's daughter then danced, and as a reward, uh, he said to her, now, what do you want? Perhaps uh, he was expecting that she might say, oh, daddy, uh, a new iPhone, or uh, a pony, or uh, a trip to Disney, uh, or whatever it was. But the daughter has a chat with mum, and they hatch a plan, and the answer is, we want John John the Baptist's head. So Herod, we see in verse 26, he's greatly distressed. He doesn't really want to do this, but he didn't want to lose face. And so John the Baptist lost his head. Well, we know what the word, he, he knew what the word said. But you see, the world, that peer pressure was stronger. 
he didn't want to be embarrassed before his mates. And so in that tug of war between the word and the world, the world won again. The word, it just seems so weak. It's just bulldozed out of the way. So the word seems so weak. And next we see that the workers are so weak. Verses 7 to 13 and then verse 30. But as we look at this section, uh, we recognise that uh, verses 17 to 29 is a flashback. So all of this could have been narrated by Mark when he first mentions the fact that John had been thrown in prison. And actually, that was back in chapter 1, verse 14. So why didn't Mark include that then? Well, he's got a very specific purpose in including this in this part of the narrative. And what we see here is that it's part of the bigger story about how workers are sent into the world, but they are weak and they are rejected. If we look at our passage, uh, we see on the screen, uh, we've got that yellow block. We've already looked at that. But at the beginning and the end, the section that we've put in green, you can see there it acts like a sandwich. And what happens there is that in verses 7 to 13, the 12 are sent out. And then in verse 30, the 12, does, they're called the apostles, they return. So they, they go and then they return. And uh, what is happening is that the middle section about John the Baptist helps us to understand what apostolic ministry, normal gospel ministry will look like. It will be people, workers going out who are weak and vulnerable. We very obviously see that when we look at John the Baptist. We've already uh, looked at him. We've already seen that he is weak and he is rejected. But we also see that when we look at the uh, apostles, because they are commissioned in verse 7. And Mark inserts uh, John the Baptist in the middle to underline that apostolic ministry will look exactly the same as John the Baptist's experience. Look at the details. In verses 8 and 9, they are sent out in weakness. Uh, they're to wear a, a sandals, a shirt, a staff, but there's nothing else for them to take. So uh, it says, uh, no bread, no bag, no money. So uh, all of these things would have been like a security blanket to uh, to help them, to strengthen them, to comfort them, to uh, pad them against all the shocks. But no, they go out completely vulnerable. No bread, no bag, no money. Very, very weak, very vulnerable. And more than that, verse 11, if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place, shake the dust off your feet. You will be rejected as well. So what we're learning here is that the, uh, uh, the word seems so weak and the workers are also so weak. And I think we can identify with that, can't we? Uh, we feel that what we're sharing with our friends is so feeble against everything that the world is telling them. And we ourselves feel so, so weak and vulnerable. We're really struggling. And how on earth can we make any difference within the world? Well, let's see what happens when we return in a few minutes. Try really hard not to sing, uh, but we're going to we're going to do actions to the song called "I'm Following the King," which has a line about how when we're following King Jesus, we want to be listening to His words, uh, which is what we've been hearing in the sermon. Um, let's do that together. Cause Jesus is my king 
deserve his love And yet he died to save me Died upon the cross I'm following the King I'm ready to obey To listen to his word Yes, Jesus is my King I'm living now for him Cause Jesus is my King I don't deserve His mercy I don't deserve His love And yet He died to save me Died upon the cross I'm following the King I'm ready to obey To listen to His word Yes, Jesus is my King I'm living now for Him Cause Jesus is my, Jesus is my, Jesus is my King Do we come to point three? God's purposes are so strong and uh, though the word and the workers seem so weak the world will never stop God's word. Isn't that an encouragement? Now, as we come to look at our passage, uh, we see we've already got this sandwich, the, uh, the green uh, bread sections, and then the, uh, the meat of the passage in the yellow, but there's a, a topping on the meat, and we can see that colored blue, the section that we've not looked at so far. And uh, just like a, a topping, I don't know, melted cheese on a burger or something like that is absolutely delicious. So this bit is very, very significant because what happens here uh, is that we notice first about John the Baptist. Uh, he is very weak. He's been executed. But Herod realises somehow that uh, this ministry is unstoppable because he says, uh, well, clearly John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. Verse 16. That's the only explanation uh, for what's happening. So Herod feels that he's in some sort of game of whack-a-mole where you uh, whack John the Baptist and uh, he goes down. But John the Baptist pops up somewhere else a bit later on. Now, Herod was wrong about that, of course. But nevertheless, uh, he was on to something and he was recognising that actually, even though John was so weak and vulnerable, actually God's purposes could not be stopped. Now, uh, Herod was, uh, sorry, John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. He was the forerunner in terms of Jesus's preaching ministry. We see that in Mark chapter one. He's also a forerunner in terms of Jesus's death. You see, uh, in the narrative that we've got in front of us in verses 17 to 30. Uh, we see that uh, both John the Baptist and Jesus are arrested due to people uh, scheming uh, and wanting to have them killed, either Herodias uh, or the, uh, the chief priests and the Pharisees. Uh, both are executed by weak leaders who succumb to peer pressure. Herod in the first instance, Pontius Pilate uh, a little bit later. And for both of them, verse 29, we see that disciples come and bury their bodies in a tomb. So there's parallels between John the Baptist and Jesus in terms of their death. John the Baptist rising from the dead. Well, uh, uh, Herod was mis mistaken, but it was a tiny foreshadowing of the real historical resurrection that Mark would refer to a little bit later to show that Jesus's ministry is unstoppable. There'll be more on this next week, but there is a contrast in Mark 6 between two banquets, two feasts. Herod, uh, he in invites all the rich and the powerful, and at that feast, with the sword, he takes life. 
But next week we'll see in the feeding of the 5,000 that Jesus will be surrounded by ordinary people, by poor people, by weak people. And he will give broken bread as a sign of his broken life in order to feed the world. You see, through Jesus's weakness, through the rejection at the cross, there will be unstoppable provision of life for the world, forgiveness and new life. And also we note that uh, not just John's ministry is unstoppable, Jesus's ministry is unstoppable, but the apostles' ministry is also unstoppable because we see that Jesus gives them his authority in verse 7. Yes, we've seen that they're weak and vulnerable, verses 8 and 9, that they're going to be rejected, verse 11. But what's the end result? Verses 12 and 13, they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. Unstoppable. And again, there's a bit of a contrast. Back in Nazareth, Jesus, verse 5, he, he wasn't able to do much except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and healed them. And look at this. These weak, vulnerable apostles, they are able to heal many. It's an unstoppable force. There's a picture on the screen of that great New Zealand uh, all-black player, uh, Jonah Lomu. And in 1995, everybody was trying to tackle him at the Rugby World Cup. And famously, uh, Mike Catt, uh, the England number 10, was uh, walked all, uh, uh, Jonah Lomu walked all over him. People tried to tackle him, but he was an unstoppable force and always seemed to get to the try line. And so it is that uh, weak, vulnerable servants of God, like the apostles, actually, under God, are an unstoppable force, even in their weakness and vulnerability. And the end result is that, what do we see? We see a broken prophet. We see a rejected Jesus in Nazareth, and a Jesus symbolised in broken bread a bit later. And we see weak and broken apostles. And it seems just a catalogue of weakness and vulnerability in this chapter. And yet, God's work progresses. God's work is unstoppable. Isn't that just a, such a, an amazing thing? God will accomplish all his purposes. So what an encouragement to Mark perhaps chatting to the Apostle Paul in prison in Rome. As Mark observes that weak, powerless, imprisoned Apostle, perhaps they would reflect together on another of Paul's writings where he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. God will get his work done. And perhaps that's the encouragement we need today. We feel that as we're holding on to God's word, it's just bulldozed by everything else that we hear in the world. It, it just seems so weak. And we ourselves, as God's workers, we are certainly very, very weak, very, very vulnerable. And we think, well, surely nothing can be accomplished here. But we're to take encouragement from what happens in this chapter. That though weak, though rejected, God's work will be done. What an encouragement for us to be able to, even in our weakness, hold on to God and to be able to pray that God would indeed build and establish his work. He's doing it through weak people in Iran just now. He's well able to do that amidst our weaknesses as well. And just one final word. It may be actually that there are some of us a bit like Herod today. We, verse 20, we love to listen to the word. And yet, actually, 
that word is then swamped by peer pressure. Well, yes, it may be difficult, but hold on to that word, even in your weakness, because that word will be the powerful seed that will enable God's kingdom to grow in you and amongst all of us. Yes, we are weak, but God is strong and will accomplish all his purposes. Amen. So we've seen in Mark two different crowds gathered for two different feasts held by two different kings, two very different kings. And so our next song invites us to turn our eyes to the better king, to the Lord Jesus.
Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Indeed, as we turn our eyes to the Lord Jesus, we do see a King worthy of glory and honour and praise, uh, the Good Shepherd King. Uh, this brings our time this morning to a close. If you're here in the building, then um, can I kindly ask that you remember the current restrictions and um, that you uh, think about going off to town to have a coffee with someone or uh, meet up afterwards off-site. So if you could please um, avoid the temptation of that playground, that would be most appreciated. Well, today we've seen just the weakness of the word, haven't we? So it's apparent weakness, and the, the weakness of apostolic ministry, the weakness of our gospel ministry. And yet, I hope you've been encouraged with that great encouragement that God's purposes are never thwarted, they're never stopped, and they keep advancing. And it's a great encouragement of those people who belong to that heavenly kingdom. The kingdom we've just heard sung about, the kingdom to come. Uh, to encourage us all, we're going to finish our time with Psalm 116. You knew it was coming, and hopefully it will come up on the screen. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the courts of the house of the Lord. Indeed, praise the Lord.